The journey of Mercier and Camier is one I can tell, if I will, for I was with them all the time. Physically, it was fairly easy going without seas or frontiers to be crossed, through regions untormented on the whole, if desolate in parts. Mercier and Camier did not remove from home. They had that great good fortune. They did not have to face with greater or less success, outlandish ways, tongues, laws, skies, foods, and surroundings little resembling those to which first childhood, then boyhood, then manhood had inured them. The weather, though often inclement, but they knew no better, never exceeded the limits of the temperate, that is to say, of what could still be borne without danger, if not without discomfort, by the average native, fittingly clad and shod. With regard to money, if it did not run to first-class transport or the palatial hotel, still there was enough to keep them going, to and fro, without recourse to alms. It may be said, therefore, that in this respect, too, they were fortunate, up to a point. They had to struggle, but less than many must, Less, perhaps, than most of those who venture forth, driven by a need now clear and now obscure. They had consulted together at length before embarking on this journey, weighing with all the calm at their command what benefits they might hope from it, what ills apprehend, maintaining turn about the dark side and the rosy. The only certitude they gained from these debates was that of not lightly launching out into the unknown. Camier was first to arrive at the appointed place, that is to say that on his arrival Mercier was not there. In reality, Mercier had forestalled him by a good ten minutes. Not Camier then, but Mercier was first to arrive. He possessed himself in patience for five minutes, with his eye on the various avenues of approach open to his friend, then set out for a saunter destined to last full fifteen minutes. Meantime, Camier, five minutes having passed without sight or sign of Mercier, took himself off in his turn for a little stroll. On his return to the place, fifteen minutes later, it was in vain he cast about him, and understandably so. For Mercier, after cooling his heels for a further five minutes, had wandered off again for what he pleased to call a little stretch. Camier hung around for five more minutes, then again departed, saying to himself, Perhaps I'll run into him in the street. It was at this moment that Mercier, back from his breather, which as chance this time would have it had not exceeded ten minutes, glimpsed, receding in the morning mist, a shape suggestive of Camier's, and which was indeed none other. Unhappily it vanished as though swallowed up by the cobbles, leaving Mercier to resume his vigil. But on expiry of what is beginning to look like the regulation five minutes, he abandoned it again, feeling the need of a little motion. Their joy was thus for an instant unbounded, Mercier's joy and Camier's joy, when after five and ten minutes respectively of uneasy prowl, debouching simultaneously on the square, they found themselves face to face for the first time since the evening before. The time was 9.50 in the morning. In other words... Mercier arrived at 9.05, departed at 9.10, arrived at 9.25, departed 9.30, arrived at 9.40, departed 9.45, arrived 9.50. Came here, arrived 9.15, departed 9.20, arrived 9.35, departed 9.40, arrived 9.50. What stink of artifice. They were still in each other's arms when the rain began to fall with quite oriental abruptness. They made, therefore, with all speed to the shelter which, in the form of a pagoda, had been erected here as protection from the rain and other inclemencies, and a word from the weather. Shadowy and abounding in nooks and crannies, it was a friend to lovers also and to the aged of either sex. Into this refuge, at the same instant as our heroes, bounded a dog, followed shortly by a second. Mercier and Camier, irresolute, exchanged a look 
They had not finished in each other's arms, and yet felt awkward about resuming. The dogs, for their part, were already copulating with the utmost naturalness. The place where they now found themselves, where they had agreed not without pains that they should meet, was not properly speaking a square, but rather a small public garden at the heart of a tangle of streets and lanes. It displayed the usual shrubberies, flower beds, pools, fountains, statues, lawns and benches, and strangulating profusion. It had something of the maze, irksome to perambulate, difficult of egress, for one not in its secrets. Entry was, of course, the simplest thing in the world. In the center, roughly, towered a huge, shining copper beech, planted several centuries earlier, according to the sign rudely nailed to the bowl, by a field marshal of France, peacefully named Saint Ruth. Hardly had he done so in the words of the inscription when he was struck dead by a cannonball, faithful to the last of the same hopeless cause, on a battlefield having little in common, from the point of view of landscape, with those on which he had won his spurs, first as brigadier, then as lieutenant, if that is the order in which spurs are won, on the battlefield. It was no doubt to this tree that the garden owed its existence, a consequence which can scarcely have occurred to the field marshal, as on that distant day, well clear of the quincunxes, before an elegant and replete assistance, he held the frail sapling upright in the hole gorged with evening dew. But to have done with this tree and hear no more about it, from it the garden derived what little charm it still possessed, not to mention, of course, its name. The stifled giant's days were numbered. It would not cease henceforward to pine and rot till finally removed, bit by bit. Then for a while, in the garden mysteriously named, people would breathe more freely. Mercier and Camier did not know the place. Hence, no doubt, their choice of it for their meeting. Certain things shall never be known. Certain things shall never be known for sure. Through the orange panes, the rain to them seemed golden and brought back memories determined by the hazard of their excursions. To the one of Rome, of Naples to the other, mutually unavowed and with a feeling akin to shame, they should have felt the better for this glow of distant days when they were young and warm and loved art and mocked marriage and did not know each other, but they felt no whit the better. Let us go home, said Camier. Why, said Mercier. It won't stop all day, said Camier. Long or short, tis but a shower, said Mercier. I can't stand there doing nothing, said Camier. Then let us sit, said Mercier. Worse still, said Camier. Then let us walk up and down, said Mercier. Yes, arm in arm, let us pace to and fro. There is not much room, but there might be even less. Lay down our umbrella, there. Help me off with our knapsack, so. Thanks, and off we go. Camier submitted. Every now and then the sky lightened and the rain abated. Then they would halt before the door. This was the signal for the sky to darken again and the rain to redouble in fury. Don't look, said Mercier. The sound is enough, said Camier. True, said Mercier. After a moment of silence, Mercier said, The dogs don't trouble you? Why does he not withdraw, said Camier. He cannot, said Mercier. Why, said Camier. One of nature's little gadgets, said Mercier. No doubt to make insemination double sure. They begin a straddle, said Camier and finish arsy versy. What would you, said Mercier. The ecstasy is past. They yearn to part, to go and piss against a post, or eat a morsel of shit, but cannot. So they turn their backs on each other. You'd do as much if you were they. Delicacy would restrain me, said Camier. And what would you do, said Mercier. Feign regret, said Camier that I could not renew such pleasure in continent. After a moment of silence, Camier said, Let us sit down. I feel all sucked off. You mean sit down, said Mercier. I mean sit us down, said Camier. 
Then let us sit us down, said Monsieur. On all hands already the workers were at it again. The air waxed loud with cries of pleasure and pain and with the urban or notes of those for whom life had exhausted its surprises, as well on the minus side as on the plus. Things, too, were getting ponderously underway. It was in vain the rain poured down. The whole business was starting again with apparently no less ardor than if the sky had been a cloudless blue. You kept me waiting, said Mercer. On the contrary, said Kamir. I arrived at 9.5, said Mercier. And I at 9.15, said Kamir. You see, said Mercier. Waiting, said Kamir, and keeping waiting can only be re with reference to a prearranged terminus. And for what hour was our appointment, according to you, said Mercier. 9.15, said Kamir. Then you are grievously mistaken, said Mercier. Meaning, said Camier. Will you never have done astounding me, said Mercier. Explain yourself, said Camier. I close my eyes and live it over again, said Mercier. Your hand in mine, tears rising to my eyes, and the sound of my faltering voice. So be it, tomorrow at nine. A drunken woman passed by singing a ribald song and hitching up her skirts. She went to your head, said Kamir. He took a notebook from his pocket, turned the leaves and read, Monday, 15, St. Macarius, 9, 15, St. Ruth, collect umbrella at Helen's. And what does that prove, said Mercier? My good faith, said Kamir. True, said Mercier. We shall never know, said Kamir, at what hour we arranged to meet today, so let us drop the subject. In all this confusion, one thing alone is sure, said Mercier, and that is that we met at ten to ten, at the same time as the hands, or rather, a moment later. There is that to be thankful for, said Kamir. The rain had not yet begun, said Mercier. The morning fervor was intact, said Kamir. Don't lose our agenda, said Mercier. At this moment suddenly appeared from nowhere the first of a long line of maleficent beings. His uniform, sickly green in color, its place of honor rife with heroic emblems and badges, suited him down to the ground. Inspired by the example of the great Sars field, he had risked his life without success in defense of a territory which in itself must have left him cold and considered as a symbol, cannot have greatly heeded him either. He carried a stick at once elegant and massive, and even leaned on it from time to time. He suffered torment with his hip. The pain shot down his buttock and up his rectum, deep into the bowels and even as far north as the pyloric valve, culminating as a matter of course in urethroscrotal spasms, with quasi-incessant longing to micturate. Invalided out with a grudging pension whence the sour looks of nearly all those, male and female, with whom his duties and remnants of bone homie brought him daily in contact, he sometimes felt it would have been wiser on his part, during the great upheaval, to devote his energies to the domestic skirmish, the Gaelic dialect, the fortification of his faith, and the treasures of a folklore beyond compare. The bodily danger would have been less and the benefits more certain, but this thought, when he had relished all its bitterness, he would banish from his mind as unworthy of it. His mustache, once stiff as the lip it was grown to hide, was no longer so. From time to time, when he remembered with a blast from below of fetid breath mingled with spittle, he straightened it momentarily, motionless at the foot of the pagoda steps, his cape agape, Streaming with rain, he darted his eyes to and fro, from Mercier and Camier to the dogs, from the dogs to Mercier and Camier. Who owns that bicycle, he said. Mercier and Camier exchanged a look. We could have done without this, said Camier. Shifter, said the ranger. It may prove diverting, said Mercier. Who owns them dogs, said the ranger. I don't see how we can stay, said Camier. Can it, I wonder, be the Philip we needed 
to get us moving, said Mercier. The ranger mounted the steps of the shelter and stood stock still in the doorway. The air darkened immediately and turned a deeper yellow. I think he is about to attack us, said King Ear. I leave the balls to you, as usual, said Mercier. Dear Sergeant, said King Ear, what exactly can we do for me? You see that bicycle, said the ranger. I see nothing, said King Ear. Mercier, do you see a bicycle? Is she yours, said the ranger. A thing we do not see, said King Ear, for whose existence we have only your word. How are we to tell if it is ours or another's? Why would it be ours, said Mercier. Are these dogs ours? No. We see them today for the first time. And you would have it that the bicycle, assuming it exists, is ours? And yet the dogs are not ours. Bugger the dogs, said the ranger. But as if to give himself the lie, he fell on them with stick and boot and drove them cursing from the pagoda. Tied together as they still were by the post-coitus, their retreat was no easy matter. For the efforts they made to escape, acting equally in opposite directions, could not but annul each other. They must have greatly suffered. He has now buggered the dogs, said Mercier. He has driven them from the shelter, said Camier. There is no denying that, but by no means from the garden. The rain will soon wash them loose, said Mercier. Less rut beside it, they would have thought of it themselves. The fact is, he has done them a service, said Camier. Let us show him a little kindness, said Mercier. He's a hero of the Great War. Here we were, high and dry, masturbating full pelt without fear of interruption, while he was crawling in the Flanders mud, shitting in his puttees. Conclude nothing from these idle words. Mercier and Camier were old young. It's an idea, said Camier. Will you look at that clatter of decorations, said Mercier. Do you realize the gallons of diarrhea that represents? Darkly, said Camier, as only one so costive can. Let us suppose this alleged bicycle is ours, said Mercier. Where lies the harm? A truce to dissembling, said Camier. It is ours. Shift her out of here, said the ranger. The day has dawned at last, said Camier, after years of shilly-shally when we must go, we know not whither, perhaps never to return, alive. We are simply waiting for the day to lift, then full speed ahead, try and understand. What is more, said Mercier, we have still thought to take, before it is too late. Thought to take, said Camier. Those were my words, said Mercier. I thought... All thought was taken, said Camier, and all in order. All is not, said Mercier. Will you shift to her? Will you shift her or won't you, said the ranger. Are you venal, said Mercier, since you are deaf to reason? Silence. Can you be bought off, said Mercier. Certainly, said the ranger. Give him a bob, said Mercier. To think our first disbursement should be a sop to bribery and extortion. The ranger vanished with a curse. How of, how of a piece they all are, said Mercier. Now he'll prowl around, said Camier. What can that matter to us, said Mercier. I don't like being prowled around, said Camier. Mercier took exception to this turn. Camier maintained it. This little game soon palled. It must have been near noon. And now said Mercier. The time has come for us. For us? said Camier. Precisely, said Mercier. For us. For serious matters. What about a bite to eat? said Camier. Thought first, said Mercier. Then sustenance. A long debate ensued, broken by long silences in which thought took place. At such times they would sink now Mercier, now Camier, to such depths of meditation that the voice of one, resuming its drift, was powerless to bring the other back, or passed unheard. 
Or they would arrive simultaneously at often contrary conclusions and simultaneously begin to state them. Nor was it rare for one to lapse into a brood before the other had concluded his expose. And there were times they would look long at each other, unable to utter a word, their minds two blanks. It was fresh from one such day as they decided to abandon their inquiry for the time being. The afternoon was well advanced, the rain was falling still, the short winter day was drawing to a close. It is you have the provision, said Mercier. On the contrary, said King Ear. True, said Mercier. My hunger is gone, said King Ear. One must eat, said Mercier. I see no point, said King Ear. We have a long, hard road before us still, said Mercier. The sooner we drop, the better, said King Ear. True, said Mercier. The ranger's head appeared in the doorway. Believe it or not, only his head was to be seen. It was to say, in his quaint way, they were free to spend the night for a half a crown. Is thought now taken, said King Ear, and all in order? No, said Mercier. Will all ever be, said King Ear. I believe so, said Mercier. Yes, I believe. Not firmly, no, but I believe. Yes, the day is coming when all will be in order at last. That will be delightful, said King Ear. Let us hope so, said Mercier. A long look passed between them. King Ear said to himself, even him I cannot see. A like thought agitated his vis-a-vis. Two points seem nevertheless established as a result of this consultation. One, Mercier would set off alone a wheel with the raincoat. Wherever he should stop for the night at the first stage, he would get all in readiness to receive Kamir. Kamir would take the road as soon as the weather permitted. Kamir would keep the umbrella. No mention of the sack. Number two, it so chanced that Mercier, up to now, had shown himself the live wire, Kamir the dead weight. The reverse was to be expected at any moment. On the less weak, let the weaker always lean for the course to follow. They might conceivably be valiant together. That would be the day. Or the great weakness might overtake them simultaneously. Let them in this case not give way to despair. But wait with confidence for the evil moment to pass. In spite of the vagueness of these expressions, they understood each other, more or less. Not knowing what to think, said Camira, I look away. It would seem to be lifting, said Mercier. The sun comes out at last, said Camir, that we may admire it sink below the horizon. That long moment of brightness, said Mercier, with its thousand colors, always stirs my heart. The day of toil is ended, said Camir. The kind of ink rises in the east and floods the sky. The bell rang, announcing closing time. I sense vague, shadowy shapes, said King Ear. They come and go with muffled cries. I too have the feeling, said Mercier, we have not gone unobserved since morning. Are we by any chance alone now, said King Ear. I see no one, said Mercier. Let us then go together, said King Ear. They left the shelter. The sack, said Mercier. The umbrella, said King Ear. The raincoat, said Mercier. It I have, said King Ear. Is there nothing else, said Mercier. I see nothing else, said King Ear. I'll get them, said Mercier. You mind the bicycle. It was a woman's bicycle without free wheel, unfortunately. To break, one pedaled backwards. The ranger, his bunch of keys in his hand, watched them recede. Mercier held the handlebar, came near the saddle. The pedals rose and fell. He cursed them on their way. <laughs>